I'm Mark Rees, and welcome to my curious ghosts and folklore podcast, where in each episode I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And in this episode, which I like to think of as the extra happy episode, we will be looking at the folklore surrounding fairy dogs, yes, fairy dogs, as well as other happy folklore about our four-legged friends. This is going to be the most positive episode ever, because in recent times, it's been getting a bit grim and gritty on this podcast. We've had terrifying ghosts with two heads. We've had cursed statues of devils. We've even had a ghost which led to the discovery of skeletal remains in a garden. It's all been a bit heavy, a bit morbid, shall we say. It's also, weirdly, been a little bit canine. Many of these stories, and it's all one big coincidence, but they involve dogs. We've had the horrific whiskey dog, the giant mastiff with glowing red eyes, stalking the haunted lanes at night. We've had the real Scooby-Doo up in Rosset, who was hunting down ghosts in the forest at night. We even had the tale of Gellert, tragic Gellert, who was killed by his master simply for being man's best friend. And so this episode is going to be like one big beam of sunlight bringing joy into everyone's hearts. And then for the next episode, I'll be right back into the gothic darkness that we've all come to expect. But for now, we're keeping things upbeat. And I am going to start this episode with a subject which I don't think any podcast in the world can outdo when it comes to a truly positive, uplifting subject. And that is, drumroll, fairy dogs. Yes, fairy dogs. Fairies and their dogs. Dogs of the fairies. Fairy dogs. I don't think that there is a more sickeningly cute and cuddly and cheerful and relentlessly positive folkloric subject in the universe that can outdo fairy dogs. Now, along with the fairy dogs, I'll also be talking about some other snippets of folklore from various places in this episode. And what I'll do, unless I'm quoting directly, I won't keep stopping and starting and telling you where every little bit comes from. But all of the information in this podcast has been sourced from folklore books, mainly written in the late Victorian period, that kind of golden age of, of folklore in Wales, some of them from the early 20th century. So it's all from the Victorian or Edwardian period. And to stop this podcast from getting too messy, because I'm going to be chucking in bits from all over the place, I'll put together a complete list of references for my website. And so if you do need to, to consult anything, all of that information will be available on my website. Also, of course, please feel free to drop me a message on, on social media or anything with any questions, and I'm always happy to help out if I can. Anyway, let's kick things off with fairy dogs. And anyone who has done an internet search for Welsh folklore will probably find that towards the top is going to be the Mary Lloyd, the Christmas time wassailing tradition with the horse's skull, which I will save for nearer to Christmas time to talk about. Uh, but the second most popular result is usually the fact that Welsh fairies would ride corgi dogs into battle. Now, that is something which I think bears repeating, and if you're able to, I think you should close your eyes and visualise this, you know, unless you are driving a forklift truck or whatever they say. If you're doing that kind of stuff, you know, if, if you're performing an operation, don't close your eyes. But otherwise, shut your eyes and imagine a fairy, a little 
cute, fluffy fairy riding on the back of a corgi, a little, cute, fluffy dog into battle. What an image. And if that doesn't put a smile on your face, then I'm just gonna give up now because it's all going to be downhill from you. That was my trump card. <laughs> but as anyone who has owned a corgi will know, be that the Queen of England or the Hounds of Hell, they will readily admit that these are magical dogs. But they are not so magical that they've seen Tinkerbell riding around their garden on the back of their pet dogs. Well, at least, at least to the best of my knowledge, anyway. So, where did this story come from? Why is it that Welsh corgis are said to be the mounts of fairies? Well, let us go back to some time long ago, when the fairies, which we should really call the Tuluith Tig, or uh, Tuluith Tig, which is one of the, the, the most popular name in the Welsh language for the fairy folk. But Urtaloith Tig, it is said, rode these little dogs into battle. And the reason that we have them now in, in our world uh, as pets is that two children happened to stumble across them in Pembrokeshire one day. And depending on which version of the story you want to believe, these children either came across a funeral procession, a fairy funeral procession in the forests where some of these fairy riders had been killed in battle. And now these riderless corgis were gifted to the children. In another version, they, they came across the dogs not in a funeral procession and initially mistook them for foxes. I mean, there is a similarity if you've never seen a corgi before. I, I can see how that mistake could be made. But either way, which, whichever version you, you would like to believe, these children ended up with the first two Welsh corgis in the world, or in, in the human world, rather. And from them, we now have hundreds, thousands, Billions, I, I, I don't know how many corgis are in the world, but they all can be traced back to these two, which these children in Pembrokeshire found from the fairies from Ur Tuluith Tig. And along with the dogs, they brought the name as well, Corgi, which, like most stories in Welsh folklore, is derived from Welsh language words. It's a combination of two words and Anyone who listened to the episode about the Gwithki, the Dog of Darkness, and I won't dwell on that because this is a happy episode, but if you listened to that episode, you will know that the word gi at the end of that, Gwithki, that gi, refers to dog. The word ki mutated to gi, and it is the same with corgi. That gi, again, is the word dog. It is the core bit at the start, C-O-R, which is different, and, and how you pronounce it is different. But the word core in Welsh is the word for dwarf. So just to repeat that quickly, core, which is short for korach, is the Welsh word for dwarf. And so you could say, some people say literally, that corgi means dog of the dwarves. Now, admittedly, to, to us now, dwarves and fairies are very much different things. We say dwarf, we think of Gimli from Lord of the Rings or some Warhammer characters with big Mohicans. Or from a, a fairy tale point of view, a Disney point of view, we think of seven of them hanging out together in a house in the forest. Whereas fairies we think of as much more the Tinkerbell end of things, much more childlike and playful. This wasn't so much the case back, certainly in Victorian times, where words were much more interchangeable, which is where you have people saying goblin instead of ghost. And again, nowadays we think of goblins as sort of baby orcs or almost little, little nasty green things, ghosts, spirits of the dead. And Vert Sykes in British Goblins does note that there was a very close connection between dwarves and a certain type of Tuluith Tig. He does list lots of different varieties of these fairies which live in different places in Wales. And to quote Sykes, he says, 
There was an intimate connection between the mine fairies and the whole race of dwarfs. Now, mine fairies were the Koblanai, which are not exclusive to Wales at all. I mean, the word Koblanai is, but these, these creatures are found elsewhere. I think possibly the most well-known variation are the knockers in Cornwall from Cornish folklore, but they're out there in, in, in Germany and France and, and, and all over the place. And the big similarity they all share is that, as the name suggests, mine fairies. They are fairies of the mines. They are found in mines traditionally, or certainly underground and in dark, cavernous places. And before we wrap up this fairy dog section of the Positive Podcast, I should point out that if you wanted to see these fairies riding into battle on corgis in action, apparently the best place to do so is in the Vale of Neath. Neath was seen as a hotbed of the fairy folk in, certainly in Victorian times. Why Neath became a cradle for the Tullow Tig, I, I do not know, but Neath is the place to go. And also, they did not just ride dogs, but fairies also kept dogs as pets, much like humans do. And it was said that their dogs, along with all of their animals, their sheep, cattle, goats, horses, they, like their owners, were endowed with supernatural powers. And also, these dogs, just like any other dogs, would occasionally stray from home. But the fairies were fond of their pets, and when lost, sought for them, and rewarded those mortals who had shown kindness to the animals. And so, you should always be kind to animals, regardless of the fairies, you should just be kind to animals anyway, but even if you weren't beforehand, this is another reason to do so, especially if you want rewards from the fairies. And to illustrate this point, I'd like to tell you a story which we can thank the Reverend Owen Jones for, a man of the cloth. So you didn't have to be some pagan to believe in fairy dogs, and this must be true. And this vicar is quite prolific with his collection of Welsh fairy stories. And so if I keep making these podcasts and you keep listening, I think there's a good chance this vicar is going to crop up again and again and again. But this particular story was recorded in the late 1800s. There's no exact date. I don't know exactly when it happened. But if it was in this reverend's lifetime, then it would have been at some point in that century. But I know where it took place. It was in the village of Pentrevoiles in Conoy. And it was as a lady walked home from church, the very church that vicar was a vicar of. And there's, there's no name given but it just says she was the wife of Havod Agarag, she found on the ground, in an exhausted state, a fairy dog. She took it up tenderly and carried it home in her apron. She showed this kindness to the poor little thing from fear, for she remembered what had happened to the wife of Bryn Hylin, who had once found one of the fairy dogs, but had behaved cruelly towards it, and consequently had fallen down dead. Now, I'm quite pleased this woman picked up the dog and helped it. I am slightly disappointed the only reason she did so is because she was scared that she might drop down dead otherwise. But nevertheless, she helped this dog, the wife of Havod Agarag. And not only that, she made a nice soft bed for the fairy dog and placed over it a brass pot. So that dog was nicely cutched up, safe and sound. And after darkness had fallen that night, a company of fairies did indeed arrive at Havod Agarag. They asked after the dog and the woman said, don't worry, it is safe and sound. And she willingly gave it up to its masters. Now, her conduct, it is said, pleased the fairies greatly. And so, before departing with the dog, they asked her, which would she prefer, a clean 
or a dirty cow? Now, there's a question. Which would you prefer, a clean or a dirty cow? Her answer was a dirty one. And so it came to pass that from that time forward to the end of her life, her cows gave more milk than the very best cows in the very best farms in her neighbourhood. In this way, she was rewarded for her kindness to the dog by the fairies. And the lesson of that story, besides always be nice to animals, which you should be doing anyway, if anyone asks if you would like a clean or a dirty cow, the correct answer is a dirty one, please. Now, our next piece of dog-related folklore is much more grounded in reality. It doesn't involve fairies or anything, and it's quite debatable if this can be considered to be a happy piece of folklore. I, I like to think this made the dogs happy. Maybe it didn't, but let me tell you the story and, and you can decide. This piece of law refers to the employment of dogs to turn roasting spits. So that's the process of cooking meat over a fire with a spit going between it, which is then rotated. And this took place in Newcastle, Emlyn. And about 100 years ago, it is said, when this was written by J. Keredig Davis in the early 1900s. So to us now, let's say this was going on in Newcastle, Emlyn about 200 years ago. And it was customary in former times to place a dog inside a wheel, which he turned with his forefeet, the wheel being connected by a chain with the wheel end of the spit. So this suggests that dogs were used to cook meat nice and evenly in centuries gone by. So, well, certainly in Newcastle, Emlyn, maybe, maybe elsewhere as well. And knowing, knowing dogs as I do, I imagine they, they enjoyed that as a game. And let, let's hope they were given some of that, some of that meat at the end of it for, for their hard work. Now, let's return to a happy dog story from folklore. And this one involves certainly the spirit of a dog, which appears to a lonely night traveller, who was, surprise, surprise, travelling by night, as his name suggests. Now, he was in Carmarthenshire, visiting Kurt Akadno, a wonderful Welsh language name, which means the fox court. And it was home to a wizard, a very famous Welsh wizard called John Harry's. Another character from Welsh folklore who I imagine is going to crop up again and again from time to time on this podcast. But anyway, this night traveller had been to visit the wizard and was all ready to set off home to Killacum, or at least I, I've done a bit of detective work. I'm assuming it's Killacum. It is spelt slightly differently in the original version. But either way, wherever he was heading to, it was said that his journey would not be easy. It was it was late as such. It was very dark and his journey would take him through a lonely mountainous country. Now, Dr. Harry's the Welsh wizard asked him if he was afraid of such a journey over the mountain in the depth of night. And the man admitted that, yes, it wasn't the most pleasant of walks in the world. It was a very lonely walk. It would be nice to have some company, but at the same time, it, it was tough in a way, tough luck, because that, that's where he lived. He had to go home. He had to walk that way. And so he said his goodbyes and off he went. Now, as he journeyed along, the darkness of night overtook him on his way over the mountain. It's very evocative. You can just imagine this man in pitch blackness. He can't see a thing fumbling his way over these majestic wild Welsh mountains. But to his great surprise, when he looked around him, he could see something following him. It was a black dog. And there it was by his side, this black dog from out of nowhere was now walking alongside this man. Now, if this man was a regular listener to my podcast, he would have been 
petrified, scared out of his wits, and he would have run for the hills because he would have thought that this was a Gwiski, the dog of darkness, come to hunt him down on the lonely Welsh roads at night. But thankfully for him, this is the Happy Dogs episode, and it turns out that that dog was very friendly. Very friendly, and the lonely traveller felt glad of the animal's company. So on they went together, and when they were near in his home, the dog, just like that, vanished into nothing. Now, it might be a shame that dog disappeared and he couldn't keep it and they couldn't live happily ever after, best friends forever, company whenever he goes walking, but nevertheless, it was nice for him to have company on that one dark night. And to us nowadays, thinking about this, we might assume that maybe that dog was a stray dog. Maybe it, it was like the littlest hobo or, or lassie to do it a good deed. Saw this man, tagged along, walked along with him. Maybe we would assume this man was hallucinating. I mean, it was pitch black. There was no light. How could he tell this was a dog? It, it could have been anything. It, it could have been a bear. Maybe he just imagined the whole affair. His mind was playing tricks on him. Maybe that's what we might think, but that is not what the man thought it was. And I'll quote to you exactly what that man thought it was, because he was convinced that the dog was nothing but a familiar spirit, with a capital S on spirit. A familiar spirit, and when we think of familiars nowadays, we, we would probably associate them with witches first and foremost. They're little diabolical helpers, apparently, running off and cursing farm animals and turning the milk and sucking teats and whatever else it is that people claimed these familiars were supposed to be doing. But in this case... It was a wizard's rather than a witch's familiar. It was a very friendly familiar, and as such, it had probably just returned to its master afterwards. Or to put that another way, this familiar, in the shape of a dog, had been sent by the wizard to keep this man company for the long journey home, and having completed that successfully, turned around and went back again to where it started. And just in case there are any doubters out there who think that is that is a crazy story, there's no such thing as happy familiar dogs helping people get home, that story comes courtesy of another man of the cloth, another vicar from Reverend J. Phillips from what, what is now Ceredigion, right next to Carmarthenshire. And if it's good enough for a vicar, it's good enough for me. All of which brings us very nicely to my last piece of dog folklore in this episode. And I know I did promise this would be a 100% positive episode. This does have a slight uh, darker side to it. But bear with me, I think it is, on the whole, a positive story. And trust me, it can be quite tricky going through Welsh folklore, trying to find things which are just 100% happy. There is usually something bad for somebody somewhere at some point. But anyway, on to our last story. And this is about spectral dogs. And spectral dogs were said to be a death omen, which in its most simplistic form, is simply a sign that something bad is going to happen, somebody is going to die. Now, this could be a sign in the physical sense. You might see something. You might see a corpse candle, canoe's corf, floating in the air. It might be more of a, an intuition, a dream maybe, a vision. But it's something that tells you that something bad is coming. And the number one sign given by these spectral hounds was... Yes, 
any excuse to reuse that Gwiltki sound effect. I am going to get my money's worth out of it. And, well, <laughs> I say money's worth. It, I downloaded it for nothing. But nevertheless, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to milk that sound effect for all I can. But the number one sign of a spectral dog or a dog's death omen was its howling. And this, in the Welsh language, was known as ki an edo. An edo being the Welsh word for howling. And ki as everyone should know by now is the Welsh word for dog. I'm, I'm going to make it my mission that if nothing else, everyone who listens to this podcast is going to know at least one word in the Welsh language, <laughs> and that is going to be the word for dog. Now, that was a sign of death. That howling was a sign of death. Also, if these spectral dogs were seen near the residence of one whose dissolution is fast approaching... As one writer rather fancifully described the process of dropping dead, and that writer also recorded the testimony of somebody who believes they did indeed encounter one of these dogs before a death. And it concerned an old servant whose aged master was ill, and she described it as being a large white dog with glaring red eyes and it sat upon the top of the steps leading from the gateway of the house. Now, she wasn't too happy to see this dog sit in there. In fact, she said its presence sent a shiver through her, and she said she felt as if cold water was running down her back. Now, an interesting point of that description is that this dog was said to be white. That is not always the case. They are sometimes white and sometimes black. Which, of course, does sound very much like a Gwilki, the black version. The terrifying, four-legged, mastiff-type beast with glowing red eyes. And I won't repeat myself here. If you would like to know more about the Gwilki, and why wouldn't you want to know more about the Gwilki, I have recorded a separate episode entirely about this terrifying beast. So please, at the end of this episode, pop back and listen to the Gwifty episode next. But anyway, back to the spectral dogs, which are usually white, but occasionally black and occasionally gwifty like They go noiselessly along the road and crouch as if in a very forlorn condition beside the door of anywhere near the premises of the doomed person. So if you see a spectral dog, be it black or be it white, crouched, looking a bit forlorn, outside the front door, that is the time to panic. And that is when the old servant saw it outside her master's house. Now, it was noted that some old women in Carmarthenshire have a strange notion about the spectral dog. They say that if a white dog appears... The soul will be saved, but if a black dog is seen, the person is very wicked and his soul will be taken to everlasting torment. So, to summarise all of that, first of all, to see a spectral dog in any shape or form is not a good sign. It means somebody is on their last legs and does not have much time left. On the plus side, if that dog is white, at least you know when that person dies, they are going to have a good time, a good afterlife in a good place. If that dog is black, however, it's probably best not to think about it. And that brings me to the end of the last tale in this compendium of dog-related folklore of Wales. And I think combined with all of the previous podcasts, we have pretty much exhausted canine law for the time being. Let's move forward with nothing but cat law coming up. Or whichever animals you would like. If you want some cat and kitten law, let me know. Maybe you'd rather have some sheep law, some cow law, some goat law. All of which leaves me to say that I would love to know what you thought of this episode. And maybe you have some experiences, some stories of your own that you'd like to share. Maybe you have a friend 
of a friend of a friend who insists that they definitely saw a fairy riding around on the back of a corgi in Neath one day. And they promise you, they assure you there was no alcohol or hallucinogen hicks involved at the time. Maybe you took a midnight walk home over the mountains and noticed a happy little dog following you back to your house. Or maybe, and I hope not in this case, maybe you've noticed a white or a black spectral dog sitting on your doorstep for some inexplicable reason. Or even if you just want to say, hello, how's it going? Track me down on social media. It's quite easy to do. Search for Mark Reese, search for Ghosts and Folklore. I'll pop up at the top of the search, or you could drop me an email if that's easier. And the obligatory shout out that if you have enjoyed this podcast, please, please, please consider hitting the subscribe button because that is the only real way that I know people are listening and it's worth making more of these things. And it's great for you because then you've got no excuse to ever miss an episode. Subscribe and you are guaranteed to get every episode as soon as it's released before everyone else. You can be the cool kid on the block who gets in first. All of which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. I hope this episode has brought a little ray of sunshine into your life. And if so, make the most of it, because in the order of balance, I should really try and find a particularly diabolical subject for the next one. Just to balance things out, so prepare for an onslaught of of, of grim and gritty gothicness next time out. And finally, before I say goodbye, I just want to remind you very quickly that if anyone ever asks you if you want a clean or a dirty cow, the answer is always a dirty one. No star.